Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many people turning up to, to listen to the talk tonight. Um, I know a lot of you are already members of Subterranea Britannica, but I know as well there's quite a few um, attending tonight who aren't. So I'll give a quick quick plug for Subterranea Britannica as an organisation. I joined about four years ago, and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed my interactions with, with Subterranea Britannica. It doesn't cost much to join. There's a great bunch of weirdos and strange peoples who love underground things and the opportunity for some fantastic visits underground. So if you're not a member already, please consider joining and you won't regret it. All right, so you've seen enough of my ugly mug. And uh, we will start on tonight's talk. So tonight I'm going to talk for about the next hour or so possibly a little bit longer, about the caves and lead mines of Sanford Hill in the Mendips. Um, this is a project that I've been involved with off and on for the last 16 years. Um, we've discovered some, what I think, are very interesting things, um, much of which um, the only way we would ever have found out is by underground exploration, because there's simply no uh, written records. This presentation, or at least a presentation very similar to it, I've presented several times before um, at Hidden Earth, which is the British Caving Association's um, conference back in 2017, at uh, the Subterranean Britannica meeting um, uh, last year, and also at the National Association of Mining Historical Organizations. In all those cases, the presentation was somewhat shorter um, than you'll see tonight. So I'm hoping that even those who've seen the presentation before, there'll be a few more nuggets of information and a few more bits of interest because I can spend a little bit more time on each of the slides. Um, the explorations described here have largely been carried out by the Mendip Caving Group, of which I'm also a member. Though there are, I'm not the only Subterranea Britannica member involved. My partner, Hayley, who some of you know has been involved, and the rather handsome gentleman there on the left-hand side of the slide, Graham Price, is also a Subterranea Britannica member. So to start off with, I ought to describe where Sanford Hill is. So for those who aren't familiar with the Mendip Hills, they lie in Somerset, which lies in the southwest, southwestern part of England, as shown on the map of, uh, the, of Great Britain on the upper left part of the slide. Much of Somerset is uh, occupied by the, the famous levels and wonderful places like Glastonbury and Burnham-on-Sea. But there are various... Um, areas of higher ground within the Mendips. I mean, some of you may have heard of the Quantocks um, and also into Exmoor. But in the northern part of Somerset, the high ground is formed by the Mendip Hills. These hills are largely formed of Carboniferous limestone. So this was deposited around, I believe, about 200 to 300 million years ago. And it's formed of the corpses of lots of dead sea creatures. As many of you will know, Carboniferous limestone um, can actually be dissolved by rainwater, which is slightly acidic due to dissolving carbon dioxide. And this and the conditions on the Mendips are just right for the formation of um, extensive cave systems. And I guess among the cavers amongst us will know wonderful places like Swildon's Hole or GB Cavern. And those who aren't cavers will probably be aware of Wookie Hole and the caves at Cheddar Gorge. Sanford Hill lies towards the western end of the Mendip Hills. And you can just see a red dot um, at the up, um, just to the upper left hand side of where it says Mendip or, or the Mendips on this map. Uh, and in fact, I'll just highlight it again this area here. This hill is an outlier of the main Mendip range and it is formed largely of Carboniferous limestone 
but it also has on its flanks much newer rocks um, from the Triassic period. After the Mendip Hills were formed, they were actually buried for some time under other, rock, under other rocks during the Triassic period. And over much of Mendip, there are still areas of Triassic rocks, and they're, they're usually very obvious because of their colour. They're usually very red. The Triassic rocks um, contain some minerals, um, typically ochres, which are used for the creation of dyes. There are an iron ore and they range in colour from sort of yellow through browns and reds. Within the Carboniferous Limestone, there are veins of metals such as lead primarily, but also zinc and other more exotic metals such as strontium and barium. The, because of this, the Mendips historically were a very major mining region which to this day most people are not aware of. Indeed, during the, uh, the Roman, uh, uh, the, the lead mining on Mendip goes back prior even to Roman times. And because of the geology on Mendip, these lead veins tend to be very rich at the surface, but taper off in depth, which will become significant to us later on in the story of Sanford Hill. So over the years, um, m many areas of the Mendips have both natural caves and mines. And in some places, the mines have intersected natural caves. And this is very much the case on Sanford Hill. So Sanford Hill, this is an aerial shot of the hill. And the hill lies within that marker I have just placed on the photograph. At the, this, this view is looking south, so the wooded area uh, on the hill is the north slope of Sanford Hill. Just out of, just out of shot to the bottom of the slide would be Bristol Airport on the next high ground to the north. To the western end of the hill, that's the right hand end in this picture, is a large quarry, Sandford Quarry, which has consumed something like 10 or 15% of the hill. The northern slope of the hill, the wooded slope, is very steep. And it's so steep, in fact, that in this area, I am now highlighting, there is a dry ski slope. And that is run by a company known as Mendip Outdoor Pursuits, and they have been extremely kind to us with the exploration on the hill in providing permission to explore and also help in exploring. And I'll say more about them later on. For those of you who like a little bit of um, a little bit of cider, perhaps, and are familiar with the wonderful adverts for the lovely quaint Thatcher's Cider and the cider not leaving the farm until Mr. Thatcher is happy. Well, the Thatcher's farm, in inverted commas, is actually this industrial unit just down here. Um, so that's the very quaint farm. But it, this is not the reason we spend our time exploring on Sanford Hill. Um, it's not just because of the proximity to the cider because there's also a rather exceptionally good pub just to the left of the photo. So we have plenty of attractions as well as the underground. Throughout this talk, I will be discussing the mines and the caves on this hill. The mines, there are various generations of mining on Sanford Hill. In more recent times, up until the 1940s, ochre was mined, particularly on the northern slope of the hill. This ochre was mined largely for pigments. Allegedly, the earliest use of these pigments 
was to smear on the belly of your ram so you could see which of the sheep he'd serviced. And later on in the 20th century, much of these pigments was you went into the uh, manufacture of um, camouflage paints. I'm not really going to talk about the ochre mining, only in passing today. But if anyone has an interest in the ochre mining, then there is a fantastic book produced by a wonderful organisation called the Mendip Cave Registry and Archive called Earth Colours, which, which covers the history of ochre mining in Somerset and is well worth a look if you're interested. The mines I'm going to talk about today are lead mines. Um, and the with the lead, there is also associated zinc. The lead is used largely in the form of galena, which is lead sulfide, and the zinc in the form of blend, which I can't, I think that is also a zinc sulfide, but I may be incorrect on that, and some calamine. The, these minerals lie in a series of veins that run east-west through the hill. So these approximately lie something like this. These are the two veins we're particularly interested in today, and there are further veins parallel to these across the hill. There are a number of um, underground exploration on the hill in terms of recreational underground exploration really started in the 1950s with the Sidcot School Speleological Society and sporadically ever since by a variety of caving clubs, one of which I must mention, which is Older Maston Caving Club. And I'm very pleased that we've got Roger Gosling um, attending and he's just prompted me to, to mention a few pieces here. But Roger was, was very heavily involved in exploration on Sanford Hill in the 1970s. And I'll mention him again in a moment. But it's fair to say that, that although it lies within a very well-known caving region, Sanford Hill has always been a little bit of a backwater as far as caving exploration goes. However, there are a, there are a large number of mine shafts known on the hill, but the wooded nature of the hill has meant that the recording of these has been somewhat confused over time, a situation that I think we have helped to um, to to um, to improve over the last fifteen or sixteen years, along with others in the particularly the Mendip Cave Registry and Archive. But it's probably worth just mentioning a few of the major sites on the hill. The first one that is probably the best known is Sanford Levy. This is a horizontal tunnel that was driven into the hill in 1830 and runs fr from the north slope southwards into the hill, much as shown with the, um, with the red line just there. In 2005, a significant mine was found called King Mine. This is located just where that red, roughly where that red dot is. It was significant for Mendip because this was actually an open, undescended mine shaft that had not been recorded in over 50 years of exploration on the hill. And it was found by members of the Wessex Cave Club uh, and revealed about 100 metres of mine passage and quite surprisingly, which intersected some quite surprisingly large natural passages. I won't mention that any further tonight. Up near the quarry, roughly where that dot I've just placed is, is another mine known as Triple Hole. And that's especially for you, Roger, because I know I missed it out when I spoke about this at the um, Subbrit meeting. Triple Hole is quite an extensive and interesting mine um but again i'm not going to mention a great deal about that tonight but it's it's as well to be aware that it's there and then roughly there is a major natural cave known as mangle hole which roger again i'm going to mention roger 
last time, I think tonight, um, was involved in actually the discovery of that cave, which was found in, I think, about 1970. I'm sure Roger will put on chat if I've got that right or wrong. And again, surprisingly for Mendip, this was an open hole that had not been noticed in, by previous generations of cavers. Finally, I will mention Pearl Mine, which we will talk about a lot, which lies on the lead vein and runs roughly across here. Pearl Mine was first descended by the Sidcote School Speleological Society in about 1950, uh, but then was subsequently blocked in 1970 and was lost to cavers but will become very important to us later on in this story. Sanford Levy is a very interesting site, and I will talk more about the mining history of Sanford Levy later on in the presentation. But especially for Subterranea Britannica, this site is very interesting in that it was a World War II auxiliary base, i.e. a base for the stay-behinds, um, the special forces of the Home Guard, if you like. Who, who would have um, acted in guerrilla warfare had the Germans invaded Britain in 1940. And there are still a very few remains in Sanford Levy that indicate that period of its, uh, of its use. Okay. And then finally, another piece of Sanford Hill history, which is part of the reason why I've been so fascinated with the hill over the last 16 years. And I'll just read this out. I hope before you publish, I shall be able to give you some account of an immense cave on Sanford Hill, which has never been explored, near which an elephant was found in 1770. The mouth of it is said by the miners to be 80 fathoms below the plain of the hill, and they have let a man down upwards of 300 feet from its verge without coming to the floor, nor could he see any sides or termination to it. They call it the gulf. Now, that was written by the Reverend David Williams to John Rutter in 1829. There are other accounts of the gulf, but modern explorers have yet to find anything that can be categorically connected with the gulf. It's still um, a matter of quite some um, controversy and debate as to what the gulf is and where exactly it lies. Um, I'm still a little bit ambivalent on the subject, but there is an excellent article available on the Mendip Cave Registry and, um, and Archive page by Robin Tavener, um, which discusses some of the possibilities of the gulf. That's not the only article that's been written. There are many, and um, I would particularly note those by um, the late Dave Irwin, who also had theories. Some have suggested that the Gulf related to a feature called the Great Rift in Sanford Levy, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And others have connected it with Mangle Hull. I'm not entirely convinced that any of the explanations fit the description. So why should we? believe that this is anything more than just a fairy tale by the miners. Well, elsewhere on Mendip, there are a significant number of these so-called lost caves that miners entered and then were lost for future generations that, has, that have then subsequently been refound and in virtually every case have closely matched the miners' descriptions. Probably the most famous of these is Lam Lear, but there is also there are also examples at Loxton Cavern and uh, on Axbridge Hill. Um, so we have every reason to believe that the miners were not um, making something up, but they were reporting something that is probably there. However, the interpretation of what this gulf may be is open still to quite a lot of. Um, quite a lot of debate, but clearly as, as an underground explorer, it would be fantastic to find or, or to clear this legend up and find a huge cavern under Sanford Hill. And this has been one of our goals. 
with the ongoing exploration. So I'll start with Sanford Levy. So as I mentioned, Sanford Levy is a tunnel that was driven into the hill in 1830. There is some contemporary accounts of the driving of the tunnel, um, but there's really most of why it's there we've had to construct from the exploration. As I said earlier, the lead veins on Mendip tend to be very rich near the surface. This is a, an artifact of the fact that Mendip was not glaciated during the, the last ice age. So unlike Derbyshire and Wales, where the top layers of the, of the uh, mineral bearing rock were scraped away, on Mendip they weren't. And this is very important on Mendip because the lead veins, the primary lead veins in the rock, are very narrow. They're, they're all, you know, they're, they are a few inches wide generally. But because Mendip is carboniferous limestone, which dissolves under rainwater, as well as forming caves, it's dissolving away the top of the limestone plateau. But the minerals in the veins are not so soluble. In fact, they're almost insoluble. So what happens is, as the top of the limestone is gradually dissolved down, the lead veins and other mineral veins became concentrated near the surface. So over a period of millennia, some very poor thin veins um, would be concent concentrated into a very, very rich vein near the surface as, as several metres or tens of metres in some cases of limestone was dissolved away. This led to a bonanza in the early phases of mining. So that's pre-Roman, Roman, Roman and through to about Tudor times and Elizabethan and through to about the 18th century. Of course, the miners at that time were not aware of this. And there's almost a, um, a simple logic, which is that if you find rich veins at the surface, you almost assume that the veins are going to be even better at depth. And we think that Sanford Levy was, an, was a late attempt to gain the riches that they believed that the old man, or the previous generation, had left behind. So what they did was to drive a tunnel at the base of the hill at 90 degrees to the, to the mineral veins. So it's a cross cut for those who are up on their mining technology uh, terminology. The aim being to intersect the lead veins at depth preferably below where the previous generation had got to, and assuming that the lead veins would be richer at, the, at that depth. Um, unfortunately, they were wrong on both counts. Um, obviously, the lead veins, as I've said, are not richer at depth on Mendip. And as we shall see shortly, they also didn't get deeper than the older generation of miners had got before them. So... When you look at Sanford Levy, as you walk down this tunnel, um, very near the end of it, you come to a section where the, the tunnel narrows to about half its previous width. And you can almost see the desperation of the guys who were pushing this tunnel in that they were using their last amounts of explosive to try and make as much distance as they could um, by cutting the size of the passage down. And like pretty much all 19th century Mendip metal miners, they probably went bust and probably ended up in a debtor's prison. Um, but the tunnel itself is, is a very fine example of a, of a horizontal mined gallery, a cross cut, um, and is a very easy underground excursion for anyone visiting the area. Uh, you just simply have to um, ask permission to, to visit to the, at the ski slope. Um, but it's well worth a visit and it's much more interesting than it sounds. So why did I get interested in a simple horizontal mined tunnel on the Mendip Hills? Well, the story goes that the, well, the, my, my involvement, we were planning 
um, one of a number of expeditions to explore lava tube caves in Iceland. And as part of the, the exploration, of course, we had to map and survey the caves we were finding. In 2000, the, the 2003, we had a team which included a large number of people who'd never done any cave surveying. Then we needed somewhere we could take a group of people to learn cave surveying techniques. So we chose Sanford Levy because it was underground, but it was dead easy. And we could have several teams working at the same time and we could compare results. Um, and the idea was that once we'd drawn up the survey, we would compare it with the, you know, with the definitive published survey. The problem was that being lazy, I, I just assumed that there was a definitive published survey when in fact, the only survey that existed was this one. And this appears in Herbert Balch's seminal book, Mendip, It's Swallet Caves and Rock Shelters. And this survey was drawn by an equally legendary caver, Willie Stanton. And I guess people had just assumed that because it was produced by Willie Stanton, that it was a very accurate survey. In fact, Willie drew this when he was still a schoolboy, and it was only ever a sketch. So the first thing I will point out is we have the main tunnel. So this is the plan at the top here, the main tunnel running into the hill. There we go. Now, that tunnel, Willie had written in Bolch's book that that tunnel was 1,500 feet long, so about 450 metres. Um, and everyone had just accepted that number from 1949 through to 2003 when we carried out the survey of the tunnel and found it to be 313 metres long. So realising that the site had never been properly surveyed, we then took it upon ourselves to continue the survey and survey these side passages shown here. So from the entrance, which is at this end, through to the, the terminal working here, there are two major cross passages known as the first crossroads and the second crossroads. The first crossroads consists of some fairly, fairly narrow uh, mined passages. And the second crossroads is a large natural cave known as the Great Rift, which Willie Stanton believed was the Gulf. So we set about then surveying these passages to quite a high standard. And I'll draw your attention to the points on the survey here on the plan where it says very loose 60 foot shaft. And here on the section, you can see that shaft heading up here and you'll notice a question mark. Now, all of the descriptions of Sanford Levy said that that shaft ended at a boulder blockage. But carrying out the survey, we felt that we had to at least look at all of the ends of the cave and the mine. So in 2004, we climbed that shaft. And this is what we found. So on the left, this is a view up that shaft. And you can see these rocks wedged in the shaft, which previous generations had all thought was a boulder choke, i.e. loose rocks that were wedged in the shaft. They're not. These are miners' deads. For those who aren't aware of the terminology, a dead is simply rock that is not ore, i.e. it's worthless rock to the miner. So this shaft, which is partially natural and partially mined, the miners stacked deads for nearly 60 feet up this shaft. 
And if you look at the top there, you can just see my face looking down from the top. So there was not a blockage. There was open passage at the top. And this was previously unrecorded. And up above there, there's about 70 metres of rather nice example of early or relatively early Mendip lead mine. But the really interesting thing for us as explorers was in the right hand photo. So this is just above the top of this shaft and looking into the cave. So the photo is taken from the top of the shaft and looking into the worked passages. And the important point are these shot holes here, here and here. And why are they important? Well, if you know what you're looking at, it's very clear that these shot holes were driven towards the camera, which means they were, the passage was driven from above, not from the levee. This suggests that these passages were entered from the top of the hill, not from the levee, and that these predate the levee. So first piece of information we think we've discovered is that the, the, the vein at first crossroads, that when the guys who drove Sanford Levy in 1830 got to that point, and they must have had a pretty shrewd idea they knew where the lead vein was, and they would have been expecting to get ore out, and they got there and they found the old man had beaten them to it and there was no lead. That must have hurt the pocket. So in 2004 then, so I've got a on the left a plan view of our survey, the entrances of Sanford Levy at the top, running down the page to the end, and you can see first crossroads and second crossroads. The these this area here was the previously unrecorded passages, and that's a section through the first crossroads. So the main tunnel, Sanford Levy, is that red blob heading into the hill, and you're looking at a profile or a section of the passages at first crossroads. So we have our shaft, 20 meter shaft up there and this little complex of passages above it that we found. Quite a nice little find, um, very interesting. But of course, we're now very intrigued as to where did the old miners come from, somewhere up here. And what we found was at this point with the red dot, there was a very strong draft and we could see open passage beyond some fallen boulders. We also knew about pearl mine that I talked about earlier. We had no accurate survey of pearl mine. And of course, this 27 meter entrance shaft had been blocked in 1970, so we couldn't access it. But we believed it was on the same vein and very close to Sanford Levy. And that gives an idea of how of the distance we thought between the two mines in the order of about 30 meters. So we started to become excited by the idea of a through trip from the top of the hill to the bottom and regaining the passages in Pearl Mine. So this gives you a view of some of the passages above um, the 20 meter shaft at first crossroads. So the picture on the left is fairly typical of the sort of narrow mined passages. You know, these are clearly a totally different scale than the, the huge, the huge um, stopes and levels that you see in the likes of Mid Wales or Derbyshire or, um, or elsewhere in the UK. These are on a much smaller scale, um, hard work. They didn't waste any time getting out rock that was, um, not all, and these guys allegedly were only really part-time miners. They were farmers as well, and they tended to mine in the winter months and farm in the summer months. Um, so this was almost like a cottage industry. So these passages are actually quite hard going. Um, that's not one of the smaller parts, that passage on the left. 
And it's quite uncomfortable because you're generally crawling on the deads that the miners left behind. The right hand picture shows the blockage at the end um, that we let that we got to in 2004. And you can see the loose rocks. These have actually dropped from uh, these have been dropped in from above. So the miners backfilled um, at some point. But you can see in this area, you can see through the boulders and into the distance. Um, we did attempt at that stage to try and dig through this blockage, but it was really scary, very, very dangerous. And so in 2005, 2006, we gave up digging here and went to dig and look for caves in far safer places. So I now move on to 2014. And my good mate, Buddy, said to me at that stage, he said, the ropes we put in, you know, we've the ropes we put into Sanford Levy on. So we rigged that 20 meter shaft permanently and left ropes in there. And Buddy pointed out in 2014 that those ropes had now been in in there for a decade and that we really should go and take them out before somebody had an accident on them. Um, so it was it that was even further um, reinforced when we remembered that those ropes had actually been bought in 1986. Um, so they were old ropes when they first went in. So in 2014, we decided to go in and, and remove the ropes as a, as a safety measure. But for the trip, Buddy said to me, he said, we ought to go and have a look at the dig at the end and just remind ourselves what it's like. So we went up there and we saw that view that I showed in the previous slide. And we thought, why on earth did we stop digging here? We can see open passage um, and it's relatively easy work. Yes, it needs a bit of work to stabilise it. So what we did, we, we took the old ropes out, replaced them with new and set about um, trying to push the end of the cave again or the end of the mine. Um, we got through that first choke and then immediately we ran across what you can see on the left hand side. So in particular, this area here, this is the base of a shaft leading up above the passage we are in. That has been backfilled by the miners. And as you can see, these rocks, and there's a lot of them, and they're big enough to do more than hurt and actually damage you quite severely, were a lot smaller than the hole of the shaft in the, in the shaft above. So you've got a situation with a almost like a giant game of kerplunk with a load of these, these rocks partially wedged in the shaft that could fall at any minute right above the next obstruction, which was just here that we needed to remove to progress. Um, so this was really dangerous and we, th this was really, really unstable. We, we talked about drilling in some brackets into the walls to support this with scaffold bar, but we, we actually thought that drilling the vibration from drilling would be enough to bring the rocks down. So what we did, um, we went and found a willing and expendable volunteer, um, our friend Graham Price, and he came up with a really good idea. It was really good because he was going to do it, not me and Buddy. Uh, and that involved Graham lying under those rocks for two sessions. Each session was about three hours long, and he gradually inserted cement in between these rocks to hold them up. We stuck an acro prop in the way, as you can see on the, the right hand picture there, um, more as sort of moral reassurance than anything else. It wouldn't really have helped very much. But Graham is very skilled in this technique of stabilizing loose rocks. And over the space of two trips, we took about 30 kilograms of cement up there, which was hard work, even between three of us. And Graham sat there, breathed very quick, very carefully, didn't make much noise. And gradually um, he secured this and made it safe. And actually now you would not even realize that it's, it's at all dangerous. He's done a superb job on it. And that allowed us then to dig and, and push the end, which actually only one more trip. We, we managed to pull two more rocks out 
and this happens. So the picture on the left, I've just popped out um, into what is, again, modified natural passage. Um, and this was actually taken on the night we broke through. I've got a big, big smile. We're now in passage that nobody has seen for 250 plus years. Um, and just beyond this picture, we, we actually broke out into a large natural chamber, which is shown. It's not a great photo on the right. There's Graham looking happy. This is a natural chamber, which the miners, they found a natural chamber. And this was a godsend to them because it gave them space to dump deads. They didn't have to haul them out of the cave. So this is a very large chamber that has been largely filled with miners deads. But it contains some very nice things. So this is rather interesting because um, we, were, we were starting to speculate what age this, this mine was. Um, and this is a piece of stemple, wooden stemple, a support from the mine. But as you can see, it's got a layer of stalagmite built up on it. So that indicated this was quite old. You know, that certainly this had been here for some time. And we also had some rather nice cave formations. These are cave pearls. Um, and there were more cave pearls. And we named this chamber Pearl's Den. And not only for the cave pearls there, but shortly before we found this chamber, a close friend of our family, uh, Dennis Vincent, had died. And his wife was called Pearl. So calling it Pearl's Den was, was actually, we thought, was quite a nice touch, quite poignant. Um, we also found these, these odd little balls of clay with a hole, with a hole pushed in them. These were found in a small piece of natural cave, and this is cave mud or clay. But right next to this is a mine shaft. And at first, we just thought it was a bored miner at the top of the shaft, just making little mud balls and pushing his thumb into them. However, when I showed this photo at the NAMHO conference um, last year, um, one of the mining experts from the Forest of Dean immediately said, I think that's a Nelly. Now, for those who aren't aware, a Nelly was very much a speciality of Forest of Dean cavers. And a Nelly was a ball of clay with a candle stuck in it, which also had a stick that was held in, which was, was on the end of a stick held in the mouth to provide illumination. So you've got a wooden stick in your mouth with a ball of clay on the end and a candle squashed into the piece of clay. We don't know for sure, but if these are Nellies, and there's, there's about half a dozen of them, if they are, it's the first time anyone has seen a Nelly outside of the Forest of Dean. So this could be quite, quite significant. There's also some curiosities. And no, the curiosity isn't Graham on the left. Um, so this is Graham just entering Pearl's Den. And I've highlighted a little tiny feature in the roof, which is then enlarged in the, the right-hand picture. And at first sight, it just looks like a little bit of stalactite. But it's not. It's metal. It's a small piece of metal that stalagmite has grown over. We're not quite sure what the piece of metal is. It's difficult to make out. It could have been a small tool or a bit of scrap iron. But we can't work out why the miners would have wedged it in the roof. Um, it seems very odd. And I, I, nobody yet has been able to provide much of an explanation of what it might be. Um, so, again, intrigued. And if anyone has any ideas, I'd be very interested to hear. Just beyond Pearl's Den was, is another natural chamber. Again, you can see the tipping of sp uh, the tipping of um, deads. I've just got a question there from Tom Wilcox. What is a cave pearl? Um, a cave pearl is a stalagmite formation. So it's it's made of the same stuff that stalactites and stalagmites are made of. However, they form in small pools where there is a drip of water, 
and the stalagmite is deposited on a core like a small stone or a or a grain of sand and as the pool is dripping then layers of stalagmite the, the calcium carbonate build up on the stone or the sand but because it's being constantly dripped on the the pearl never sticks or it, only only once it gets very heavy um and you will see better examples of these later on but i hope that answers your question tom this chamber in here as well provided another interesting um piece of the knowledge of what had gone on in these mines because if you look just down here and it's not the only example that is ochre there are there are large lumps of ochre in amongst the deads. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us at the time this mine was being worked, the ochre was not valuable enough to take out of the, the mine. They were not, the 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 miners at this time were not interested in ochre, despite the fact that in the the, the 19th and 20th century, ochre was quite a valuable commodity. So that's an interesting finding as well. They couldn't even be bothered to take it out of the of the mine or cave. Um, but you can also see in here, if you look into the roof, just to the, the, the right of me there, you can just see some soot marks. These would have been marks from the candles that the miners illuminated the cavern with. I mentioned earlier that... Um, these chambers were actually quite large and largely filled with these deads. Um, what we found in this chamber was these deads on the right of the photo, you could squeeze between the dump deads and the roof of the natural cave passage. And we can get about 10 or 15 meters um, along that, that space, which means that the passage the natural cave passage is over 15 metres wide. That's very large, particularly by Mendip standards. Of course, we don't know how high the passage was because it's full of full of dumped debris. Um, but still very significant that this is a significant piece of natural cave formation. You know, and, and the, 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 the word gulf is starting to um, starting to come close to the back of your mind at this point when you when you see this. Um, and. Above this chamber, so this is looking up, there was a shaft going up. Um, this shaft is rather spectacular, and I'll mention some more about it shortly. Um, but this was quite a find. So, again, this is now starting to say to us, well, this may be the way that the miners came in from the surface. The real conundrum at this point is we've gone more than 30 metres and we're not in Pearl Mine. We know that this does not match the descriptions of Pearl Mine, but according to the, sur the best survey data we had, we should have been in Pearl Mine because we're in the same vein. So we know that either the survey is wrong or something else is happening. So we have a look at this shaft. We can climb up a short way on stacked deads, and there's lots of evidence that this was a major haulage route. There's rope marks. The the from, from hauling, the the deads are all um, very clearly worn from kibbles being hauled up this shaft. Um, and the one thing that's really going through our mind is, what age is this mine? And we joked at this point, wouldn't it be great if one of the miners had left a date in here for us? So as we're joking, Buddy turns around and says, I think you need to look at this. So at first glance, it's a flat bit of rock. Uh, but if you look closer, you can see some very faint white scratching. Um, and it took us quite a while to work out what was going on. But the clear thing we could see on the left was the one and a seven. OK, in here. And we could see something that appeared to be a name across here we're now getting quite excited this is this is very interesting and eventually we managed to um we managed to decipher it a hancock 
1738. So Mr. Hancock, we, we assume it's a Mr. Hancock, visited this mine almost 100 years before Sanford Levy was driven. This is quite exciting. As an aside, we tried to, to see if we could sort of trace this Mr. Hancock and his family. Um, and what we soon discovered was that Winscombe Parish and Sanford, Sanford Hill lies within Wins, Winscombe Parish. Virtually the entire population of that village in the 18th century had the surname Hancock. There's a lovely little passage um, which you can find online of uh, an interview with an elderly lady who was, a, who was a member of the Hancock family describing her marriage in the early 19th century. And to paraphrase, it describes that she was a Hancock before she was married. She was a Hancock after she was married. The groom was a Hancock too. So was most of the congregation. In fact, only the vicar wasn't a Hancock. So it's somewhat difficult to try and trace um, anyone called Hancock in Win Winscombe Village um, or Winscombe Parish. But it's still, again, lovely piece of history. And clearly with no written records, this is the best dating material that, that, um, that exists for these older workings, these 18th century workings on Sanford Hill. And then, so that inscription was at the bottom of the shaft I just discovered, uh, just discussed. And this is looking up the shaft, which we've now named Hancock shaft, hopefully for obvious reasons. This is a partially natural shaft. It's some 90 feet, 27 meters high. It is lined with dry, um, with stacked deads for its entire height. So the, the old miners thoughtfully created a tottering pile of loose stones, some 27 meters high, which they then supported with these lovely robust stemples, like that one you can see here, which is holding up a whole load of rock above it. Um, and of course, now after 250 plus years, really has the structural strength of wet tissue paper. So the shaft, though it's spectacular and lovely, partially natural, as you can see with these scallop marks here for those who are in the know, which shows that it was formed by water under solution. Um, but there's a big stack pile of deads. We climbed this, as you can see, our, our friend Brian Snell and Keith Knight, who are very good rock climbers. They managed to climb this shaft and, and rig it with rope. But we were rather hopeful we would find some more open passage at the top. But instead, this is the top of the shaft on the left. We were we were met with a backfilled um, passage above, which would take a great deal of excavation to get through, as can be seen here. So that really stopped or, or, or provided the end of our exploration of these passages in 2015 in Sanford Levy. All in all, we'd added about 150 meters of new, new to modern explorers passage um, in, in the mine. And we'd also answered a few questions, um, but we'd also raised a few questions, not least of which was where the hell is Pearl Mine? Um, so, um, you know, this was, this was um, quite a conundrum. Um, I ought to also point out that um, we also found some more graffiti in that large chamber um, that uh, with the deads in and the ochre that I mentioned before. And you can see in the right-hand picture, the initials TH smoked onto the rock um, here. Um, bizarrely enough, the initials TH were found by our friend on the left here, Tom Harrison. Now he swears he didn't put he didn't smoke those on, but we think this is another Hancock. But this point, by rights, we should have been well and truly inside Pearl Mine, but we weren't. So this is a big question. So what have we found? So this is 2015. We have again, we're looking along Sanford Levy, which is there so you'd be walking into the levee so you're walking 
south to north. We have the 20 meter shaft we climbed in 2004. And we then have the passages that we recorded in 2004 for the first time. And then in 2015, we found all of that bit. So we now reassessed where we thought Pearl Mine was. So we went back over all the data we had and we thought it was actually now somewhere above us. But again, not entirely certain. But, you know, at this stage, we thought this is a job well done. But what else can we now do? Because we've exhausted opportunities inside the mine. And so attention was focused back on Pearl Mine. So what we decided to do, we bit the bullet. We decided to go and reopen Pearl Mine that had been lost in 1970. So what is Pearl Mine? Well, the reports, and this survey appears in the, the Mendip Underground, the Caver's Guidebook, which was published in 2015 the latest version or the latest issue and pearl mine was shown as a 80 foot 24 meter um, entrance shaft with two sets of galleries leading off one at 50 feet depth about 15 meters and one at 80 feet depth about 24 meters um, and these passages were described as as partially natural um, and so it seemed like a worthwhile project in its own right to open Pearl Mine. But what we were really keen on doing was looking at this end, the extreme end here, which we knew was very close to those passages or must lie very close to those passages we'd recently explored in Sanford Levy. And if you look on that survey, again, there's a question mark. And the previous explorers' descriptions from the 50s and 60s said that you could see open passage through dangerous boulders. So this to us seemed like a really good project. If we could reopen Pearl Mine, that we would have um, a really good chance and probably easier way to dig down into what we'd found in Sanford Levy than rather than trying to dig up, which is always more dangerous. The problem that we faced was that this shaft had been completely backfilled. Um, so Linda Wilson just asked the question, is there any more graffiti or inscriptions in the mine? The only graffiti we found is the, um, the signature of Mr. Hancock, 1738, and the smoked TH. However, in TH chamber, that's where the, the, the TH, the smoke TH is located. There are some what at first sight appear to be just random pick marks. However, as some of you may, may be aware, and Linda more than most, um, myself and Haley got caught up in, in ritual protection marks um, discovering Creswell Caves, but Linda's quite a big expert. Uh, on on ritual protection marks, these scratch marks, and some of them are quite large, may and just just may be some form of um, ritual protection. That they mean that there are um, a series of crossing, intersecting lines, and that may be related to entering a, a, a fairly large natural passage. So Linda. If you want to come and have a look and make a decision, you'd be more than welcome and we'd be delighted to have your opinion. Um, but so where I was, so we've got the entrance shaft in Pearl Mine. That had been filled with debris in 1970. The big quarry at the western end of the hill, the quarry owners um, built a track along, um, more or less along the line of the mineral vein that contains the workings on First Crossroads and Pearl Mine. And as part of that, they bulldozed an awful lot of the material down the entrance shaft of Pearl Mine. So 
this we knew was not going to be a simple job. You know, we've got an 80 foot mine shaft full of rubble and mud and actually um, anecdotally a truck and some cows as well. Um, we were lucky in one respect. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, that was a mistake in that the top of the shaft had been located by some members, some uh, employees of Mendip Outdoor Pursuits. And they had actually started to excavate and they had excavated down to about three meters depth in the shaft. Another reason we wanted to get into pearl mine was, funnily enough, the pearls after which it was named. Now, these pearls were described as the size of pigeon eggs, which is most unusual, very, very unusual. And there's a photo here from the uh, the Mendip Caves, which was by um, Barrington, Nick, Nick, Nick Barrington. And this was a guidebook to the Mendip Caves in the 1960s. And you can see here they're, they're rather spectacular. So as well as the interest in trying to connect to Sanford Levy, we were very interested to see these 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 rather wonderful formations again for the first time in best part of 50 years. So where did we start? So the picture of myself lifelining uh, Keith Knight to go and dig in Pearl Mine. This is pretty much the condition that we started digging. So the Mendip Outdoor Pursuit guys had dug three or four metres down and they put a temporary cover over the shaft um, we brought, we built a, a scaffold tripod over this and we started to dig and haul out um, the fill from the shaft. We knew this was going to be a long effort and we dug approximately once a month um, and generally spent the whole day up on Sanford Hill. And we knew it was going to be a bit of a siege, so we made everything as easy for ourselves as we could. And so as well as the digging, we always had a fire going with the kettle brewing donuts and it became a bit of a social event as well as a um, as hard work and digging with Bill here, just carefully selecting the difficult decision of whether it's a jam donut or a flapjack to go with his cup of tea. And as time went on, we got more ambitious. We cooked pies over the fire and we had ice cream delivered. Um, Mike Richardson in the brown T-shirt in the, the bottom left photo. We had his 60th birthday party while we were digging. Um, and all in all, you know, it became it's a very pleasant place to be in the in the woods, um, particularly in the summer. Um, it was very hard work, particularly as the shaft got deeper. Um, you know, we were we were typically removing about a ton and a half of material per session. Uh, and a ton of a ton and a half got us about a meter and a half depth each session. Um, and here you can see, you know, poor old Brian here, really suffering with this underground exploration, enjoying a beer in the in the seats. Um, we actually stashed our deck chairs in the shaft when we weren't there. And again, Graham, another sub Brit member, and and our hero from the um, cementing of the boulders in Sanford Levy is there busily deciding exactly what sort of ice cream um, he should have with his, his digging effort. So it was, it was great fun, really good social event. And it was really great because we, we, we knew what we were heading for. We knew what sort of depth we had to get to. And we were making really good progress. And we had, it was a fantastic team, actually. I've, I've been um, involved in underground exploration for 30 odd years. And this is without doubt the best fun team and social team we've had no falling outs at all it's just been a real team effort to to empty this shaft it was great fun and blow it all after about um about um early 2017 we actually broke into the upper level gallery um Morris, if it's all right, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the question about surveying possibly at the end because um, it's quite an involved answer. Um, but um, so we're, there we are, early 2017. We've got to where it says walled shaft, which is here. 
and we've opened up the upper gallery. So between there and there. Um, this passage was actually far more interesting than the previous descriptions had suggested and was actually quite a, a little bit more extensive, but not a lot. But the really interesting bit was the very short gallery on the right hand side here. And as you can see at the end of it, there's this little hole with a question mark. And that is shown in the photo inset upper left. And that hole is about four inches or 100 millimeters for those who are um, more metrically minded across and maybe 300 millimeters or a foot high. But through that, you could clearly see large open passage and a strong draft. So we were still digging downwards to intercept the lower gallery, but we actually took um, a bit of a detour to enlarge this hole. We took a decision because it looked like it may provide a quicker route into the lower the passages below because it was clearly close to um, these passages here. And it may have allowed us to come in through the roof, which would avoid having to carry on digging down through this section. So we duly enlarged that hole and popped through a short, very tight section that we call the pension pot, um, referring to the age of most of the diggers. And this is what we found below. And I love this, this photo. It's actually a still from a video that Andy Horechki took on the first trip through the pension pot. And Martin here, Martin Cross, um, a.k.a. Eeyore, as he's known, um, has just popped through the pension pot for the for his first time. So there's three of us down there now, and he's just seen what's the other side. So Martin's popped through. This is pure, unadulterated joy at expiration and seeing something that no one has seen for nearly 300 years. And what's he looking at? It's this. It's big passage. Um, this was unexpected. This was not entered this by the previous generation of cavers. This is not part of the previously known pearl mine. And again, this is natural passage that's been modified by the miners. Um, and rather superb, large passages, um, very unlike those we, we'd seen in Sanford Levy. The passages, you know, we, we not far from there, there is a superb um, or a large drop which you can traverse over, known as Fingers Traverse. Um, so there's a picture of me on Fingers Traverse there uh, on the left. And what you can't see, and is it's almost impossible to photograph, um, the rock to the above my left shoulder, so on the right hand side of the photo, is covered in a thin layer of mud. And there are a set of three finger marks in that mud. Uh, sorry, four feet. It's the, the, you know, where, where somebody's hand is, is smeared down on the mud. Um, and the, the full width of that hand, of those finger marks, is less than three of my fingers. So it's, so it's a child's handprint. And that mud is actually covered by a thin layer of stalag stalagmite. So again, we are sure that that's a miner in both sense of the terms. It was a miner, i.e. E-R, and a minor. So it was a child who was working in the mine at the time. And on, that, on those first couple of visits, we got through to the point you can see on the right here, and this is the team that was um, pushing there. So we've got Martin Cross um, at, the, at the top left, and then coming back down, Tom Harrison, Graham Price, Mike Richardson, and Mike Moxon. Um, and this is as far as we got on those first couple of visits. The passages are full of lots of um, uh, interesting remains. You can see Tom here looking at minus pick marks and the whole of the passage is full of this stuff. And that's me looking at what appears to the casual observer to be a rock. 
But if you look a bit closer, the rock looks a little bit different to the rest of the rocks around it. That's because it's old red sandstone, not, not limestone. And a closer look, you can see it's got some grooves in it across here. This has been seen before in Mendip Caves, and it's a sharpening stone for the tools that the miners used. And there's three or four of these in, in uh, this new section of Bull Mine. So quite fascinating. We also found some animal remains. This is a rabbit. Um, so there's the rabbit around there. And just in there is a bat. And that bat had a ring on it, and it was ringed in 1960. So the bat had been able to get in 1960. Um, so Graham being Graham, that end that I just showed you, he, he thought there might be some more beyond that. So Graham, you can see Graham here digging into that um, obstruction at the end. Graham with his surname Price, we decided to call it the Price is Right because it popped out into a substantial natural chamber. Um, this chamber is 15 metres or 50 feet long, uh, 30 foot or 9 metres high and up to 5 metres wide and has some very pretty stalagmite formations in it. Um, we found this on the night that one of our diggers actually died. Um, I haven't mentioned him before, Biff Frith, who was a stalwart of the Mendip Caving Group digging scene, actually died on the night we found this. So this large chamber is known as Biff Frith's Big Rift. OK, and then shortly after that, we dug through the bottom of the shaft and we reopened the uh, sorry, we didn't dig through the bottom of the shaft at this stage. We actually linked those new passages through to the previously known lower gallery in Pearl Mine. Um, and you can see some great examples of deads, the very large passages again, but there's deads stacked here. Um, and in the, the right hand photo, you can see the effect of a miner's blast just there. And you can also see where they've wedged rocks and stemples to work on. So those rocks were wedged in by the miners and they would have stood on those and worked. So, you know, this was great stuff, great bit of mined passage. And of course, we rediscovered the pearls. So there's young Tom. Tom, Tom is the youth of our digging team. He, he has the audacity to merely be in his 30s. Um, but, um, but Tom is actually a really great researcher and has found out a great deal about the, the history of the exploration of the previous generations of explorations in these in in this place. So these these cave pearls, very very nice. You can see one or two big ones, but we thought doesn't quite match the old photo. So here we go. On the left is the old photo, and on the right is the one taken in 2017. And if you look carefully, we can match those three pearls to those three. But all of these have gone. So somebody removed those prior to the mine being blocked in 1970. It's probably completely fruitless, but if anyone's got a clue where they are, it would be lovely to find them and try and put them back. Um, but um, so even though it's hopeless, I will continue to ask um, if anyone knows of their whereabouts um finally we we got to that um point that we were interested in that we thought was close to sanford levy and again we enlarged the end of the, the passage um we found a short section a very pretty passage um, known as broadside which tom is sat in there some it's natural cave there's no, the miners never went in this bit but again very mysterious because we still weren't in sanford levy what the hell was going on? You know, we should, but you know, the survey data was clear. We should have been in, we, the, the two should have been connected, but we weren't. We put people into both Sanford Levy and Pearl Mine at the same time, and we established a noise connection, but we still have not found a physical way through between the two. Um, here's a couple, another couple of pictures of some of the, the crystal pools in Broadside. They really are very pretty. So this shows um, our survey of the hill. 
Um, so the, the orange lines are the contours of Sanford Hill. Um, where the contours are curtailed, that's the quarry. This here is King Mine. Here is Mangle Hole and a couple of um, uh, other mine shafts. Triple Hole I haven't surveyed, but it's up and around here somewhere. And there's a few other little mine shafts on the same vein here, known as Savile Row shafts. Sanford Levy runs into the hill there. And then pretty much all of the green and blue is, the, is Pearl Mine and the workings on First Crossroads. So as you can see, that the this is quite an extensive mine, or a very extensive mine, by Mendip standards. The scale, uh, Roger, the scale on the pearls, if you don't mind, I'll just pop back. So the largest of those pearls that's there now is probably an inch and a half, 40 millimetres in diameter, so fairly substantial. Um, you know, typically in the UK, you know, most cave pearls are a few millimetres across, you know, maybe maybe up to 10 mil. So these are very large, but the ones that have gone missing were even bigger. I hope that answers your question. And this is the finished product in terms of the actual cave survey that we've produced. Um, in this case, probably the most useful view is the lower right view which is the section through the, the mineral vein um, with pearl mine to the right and sat the workings in Sanford Levy to the left. Sanford Levy is in a, in a, is in a gray color and pearl mine in black. And as you can see, the two have passed each other. So pearl mine here actually comes past Hancock shaft. What that shows is that the, the vein is actually not a single vein. It's several veins in close proximity. And we now think that the two are about three metres apart horizontally. Um, so we're still looking to see where any connection could be, but we still haven't made it, even though we can make sounds from one to the other. So... I've got to thank a fair few people. First of all, I've got to thank Mendip Outdoor Pursuits for providing permission to access and explore on Sanford Hill. And as I say, they've been fantastic in what they've allowed us to do. Um, it's not everyone who allows a bunch of um, disreputable cavers to come and dig holes on their land, especially when those holes are 80 feet deep and right next to a footpath. Um, I've got to particularly thank the whole digging team who are such a great bunch, but particularly tonight, Graham Price, Tom Harrison, Mike Moxon, Andy Horechke and Mike Richardson for use of their photos. Um, and finally, um, if anyone's got any questions, we've got about 10 minutes, but we've got a hard cut, cut off at eight o'clock. Um, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, so I've got a question about surveying. Um, you mentioned any scanners yet. Yes, people have used scanners in caves. And I would particularly point to the efforts that, um, oh, what's his name? Dixon, uh, Kevin Dixon, has done in scanning some of the world's largest cave chambers out in China and um, uh, in Sarawak. Um, and various other people have, have um, carried out various um, various scanner surveys. The surveying here is much more traditional. It's a sensor line using, uh, in this case, actually a, um, a device known as a Disto X, which is a laser range finder equipped with a compass and a clinometer. And we it's all built up from a sensor line survey. Um, so Amata Hink, will you make a connection if there isn't a natural one? The answer is no. If, if we're gonna make a connection, it will be the way that the miners did it. We, we're not going to cut through solid rock. That, that's not something we wish to do. Um, you know, if, if the miners did it, if it's a case of moving deads, um, then then we will do that. But we're not going to create, an, if you like, an artificial or even more artificial connection. Any more questions? Um, 
25th. Um, no more questions? Okay, well, in which case, thank you very much for your attention tonight. And that's the end of the presentation. Um, and I hope you're all going to tune in for the Williamson's Tunnel one um, in, in, a, in a week or two's time. Thank you very much. And I'll see you all underground before too long. Bye bye.